This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 140, recorded on July 1st, 2011. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and this is TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from North Central Florida, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. How you doing? We're all right. How are you? Good. We, we missed you. Yeah, well, I've been out playing. You've been having you know? a grandson or child. <clears throat> That's right. Been doing that. Congratulations. Thank you very much. It's all good. But it's good to have good. you back. It's good to be back. Excellent. Missed you guys. We, we, we were hoping you would say that. Yeah. Well, it's all true. Good. You're not making it up. No, I'm not making it up. <laughs> also joining us today from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. How are you, Alan? Oh, doing okay. It's a nice day today, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. We've suddenly been having nice weather after all that rain. Very good. Good to have you back, of course. Yeah. And our guest today is also from Massachusetts. She's a professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School. Judy Lieberman, welcome to TWIV. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Good to have you, and thanks for spending time with us. We thought we'd talk about a recent paper of yours um, about inhibition of HIV transmission, uh, which I think uh, Alan brought to our attention initially, right, Alan? Yeah. You yeah, I, uh, I, I went and visited Judy about a year and a half ago and did an article for Nature Medicine about her work and the, the related field of, uh, of microbicides. It was a year and a half ago. Yeah, I think so. Hey, Judy, it was, it, it was in an ice storm. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're right. <laughs> so you didn't use Skype. I've been working on this for uh, a decade, so... A year so, and a half doesn't seem so long. Uh, so the, your article, uh, Alan, is called, it was in Nature Medicine, it's called An Apt Approach. Right. Was that your title? Yes. If, that sounds like it. Sounds it. like an Alan Dove title, <laughs> doesn't it? Do you like that title, Judy? I do. It's really good. <laughs> you know, Alan makes up most of the titles for TWIV episodes, and he's really good at it. He's the only one amongst us with a sense of humor. No. <laughs> Well, I don't know. I have I have a sense of humor. Yeah, I I know it's not obvious. I I understand. So the paper we we want to talk about today was published in the Journal of Clinical Investigation, which I know well. I used to be on the editorial board, and the title is "Inhibition of HIV Transmission in Human Cervical Vaginal Explants and Humanized Mice Using CD4 Aptamer siRNA Chimeras." Long title. So we'd like to talk about that. But I noticed, Judy, reading Alan's article, that you have a very interesting history uh, in getting where you are today. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Okay. I, I actually started out as a theoretical high-energy physicist. I have a PhD in that. And I worked on uh, the unification of the basic forces between elementary particles uh, when I was, I was a member of the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, which is where Einstein was, so I, I was pretty successful in physics. But I decided that I wanted to do something that was more uh, directly involved with people and socially useful. So I decided to go to medical school, um, and I, I I went to med. I was an intern the the year that the first AIDS cases came out. Hmm. And, you know, at that time there were, there were no drugs for AIDS and it was one of the most gruesome uh, deaths. Um, so me, you know, like a lot of other people of my generation, we really wanted to do something uh, for the AIDS epidemic. And so even though I intended to never do research again, <laughs> I found my my way back to research pretty rapidly. So you after, so you went to medical school. Where did you do that? At, at Harvard, I I was in a uh, program that's a joint Harvard MIT program mm -hmm. that's actually designed to uh, 
take advantage of science and technology and sort of marry it to medicine. Uh -huh. and it's a program that makes a, or trains academic physicians. Okay. Physician scientists. So then after medical school, did you do some kind of postdoc? Well, first I trained in internal medicine and uh -huh. hematology oncology. And as part of that training, you have to spend two years in a lab. So I, I, I did a postdoc at MIT in Herman Eisen's lab. And at that time, MIT was really in the forefront of molecular biology. And uh, the Eisen lab was involved in cloning the T cell receptors, which you know basically opened up the whole field of T cell immunology. Mm -hmm. And so I knew that we studied cytotoxic T cells, which are important in antiviral immunity. So I, that's sort of how I uh, segued into doing research that was, uh, um, I, I, I knew that you could cure or prevent leukemia or lymphoma caused by retroviruses in mice but with um, antiviral cytotoxic T cells. So mm -hmm. I got involved in trying to do that for HIV. This, uh, the, f the transition between physics and, and biology is very interesting because I, we have a faculty member here who actually used to be at the Institute also in Princeton. He was a string theory person. Hey, well, I, that's close to what I did. Yeah. So he, used to, <laughs> he, he worked with, um, he heard Arnie Levine give a talk one day on HIV uh -huh. And he said, I have to work on this. And that's what he does bioinformatics on HIV and other viruses now. And he's here. He's What's his name? And, you know, of course, the whole field of molecular biology was really started by physicists in the sure, 40s. Sure, Mac, right? Max Delbrook was a physicist. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Wally Gilbert. Um, Wally Gilbert. Yeah, there are, there are a lot of them. <laughs> it's very interesting. Yeah, Leo, Leo Sillard was another one. Right. And they used, they said, we have to have a very quantitative system, and they started with bacteriophages, right? And they applied their view of how things work to bacteriophages, and that really got the field started. So it's not the first time that this has happened, clearly. It's, but it, the, the, the moral is that you can change fields entirely and yeah. do something else. I think it's also gives you a different uh, outlook on things. So it's it's always productive to come at things from a different right. point of view. Now, the paper we want to talk about deals with um, developing microbicides, and it's specifically topical. Hello? Yes. Can you hear you us? Were, you were just fading. Yeah, I tend to do that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, the, 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 pay, the JCI paper we want to talk about involves topical vaginal microbicides. So can you tell us a little bit about this and why this might be a good uh, way to prevent infection? Okay, well, um, most HIV transmission occurs through sexual uh, exposure. And um, the best way to, you know, control the epidemic is to prevent its spread. Unfortunately, despite um, 25 years of vaccine research, we it's really don't have a vaccine that prevents HIV transmission. So um, instead of a vaccine, um, you can, you know, educate people and teach them, you know, not to engage in risky uh, behavior. And the other approach is to try to develop something topical, topical that can prevent transmission. Um, so that this year, for the first time, um, a topical microbicide has shown some efficacy in, in preventing HIV transmission. A study with a uh, tenofovir antiviral uh, drug in a gel in South Africa uh, prevented transmission by about 39%, which is a good start. Mm -hmm. But the, the, one of the main obstacles for microbicides is that for most types of microbicides, you have to remember to use it just before you have sex. And uh, that's a huge obstacle in terms of uh, what doctors call compliance. Mm -hmm. 
just it's hard to do. Um, so I I became interested in developing a microbicide based on RNA interference because I found that we could get agents to work um, that lasted for a week or two um, that might be effective. Hmm. Uh, so that removes a lot of the uh, impediment to to applying the gel just before sexual activity. You do it once a week, perhaps. That's the idea. Yeah. So uh, we haven't. We're just beginning to look at how how durable or how long lasting the this uh, approach that we have for HIV um, mm -hmm. is. But for herpes, which was the first model uh, we looked at, we're able to get protection uh, for a week. So when we we could either treat people with the microbicide agent um, af actually after they were exposed to the virus and got protection or mm -hmm. as early as a week before. So uh, the, the anti-herpes uh, microbicide that this is an siRNA guy, has that actually been tried in humans? Is that what I'm hearing? Oh, no. We, we, so when we first um, tried to develop um, a model in which we could use RNA interference or test it, we went to mice because, uh, we went to herpes because it was the only sexually transmitted infection model in mice. Okay. Um, and we were able to get it to work. And then in mice uh, to prevent a lethal challenge of sexually transmitted herpes in mice, but I have not been able to get any company to develop this for human trials. So it's in the mouse model that you saw that you could uh, get efficacy a week after the application. Is that correct. right? That's correct. Okay. So in the in the herpes case, what were you targeting with the siRNAs? Uh, so we we. We actually tested uh, targeting, knocking down either uh, a receptor for herpes, which is called nectin-1, mm -hmm. uh, on the surface of epithelial cells, or viral genes. And they both worked, but a cocktail that used um, ne that silenced nectin and vir a viral gene uh, was better. Mm -hmm. So what do you actually put in the... Do you put uh, small RNAs, or do you put a plasmid that will make uh, the RNAs? No, it's, it's small RNAs. Okay, so, so they're... The, go ahead, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, they're duplexed RNAs, like short interfering yeah. duplex, okay. So for herpes, uh, we, we did two things. The first thing we tried was we mixed the RNA. So the main obstacle to RNA-based drugs is you have to get them across the membrane of cells into the cell where the machinery for RNA lives. And uh, there, we tried two things. The first thing we tried was to mix the RNA with a lipid like you would use in the laboratory for transfection. And that worked very well. Uh, we could get the RNAs into cells throughout the vaginal tissue, deep into the lamin appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, but we later found that that wasn't such a good idea because the the lipid actually helped infect cells with the with herpes because it's an envelope virus, so it basically facilitated the or transfected the virus into cells. So then we developed a way where we conjugated cholesterol to the RNA and didn't need to use any uh, lip, other lipid. And that worked very well. So uh, we didn't have any toxicity, and uh, we got very good delivery. But that strategy that we, so herpes infects epithelial cells and neurons, um, but HIV infects immune cells, T cells, macrophages primarily. Right. And um, so the cholesterol conjugated. Uh, approach works for epithelial cells extremely well, but it it, it works for dendritic cells, but not for 
uh, very well for macrophages or, and not at all for T cells. So we needed to develop some other way of getting the RNA into the cells that HIV infects. So that involved targeting the siRNA to CD4 expressing lymphocytes, correct? Right. So the strategy we used uh, was to make a chimeric RNA in which one end was with a structured piece of RNA called an aptamer, which you can think of as a nucleic acid antibody. It can be, the RNA can be selected to bind with very high affinity like an antibody to CD4. And at the other end was the interfering RNA that was effective for gene silencing. Mm -hmm. So the, the chimeric RNA gets taken up by any cell that expresses CD4, which includes all the cells that HIV infects, uh, uh, T cells, macrophages, and dendritic cells. Now, it's not, uh, it's not, it's not obvious to me well, I mean, I can see how an aptamer would target things to a CD4 positive cell, but just binding to CD4 doesn't necessarily result in internalization, correct? Yes, that's correct. And we're just studying now the cell biology of, of how the RNA gets delivered. Um, so the the aptamer is actually just one. Uh, it's what we call monomeric. It it's not, doesn't cross-link the CD4 receptor. But there is like a low-level chronic internalization of all cell surface membrane receptors. Um, and we, that's how we think it, it gets endocytose through that uh, constant uh, receptor recycle. And so in terms of, in terms of your research, it was kind of a, a, a leap of faith in a way, wasn't it, to uh, make this uh, CD4 aptamer target and hope that the siRNA would get taken up uh, if you actually targeted it towards CD4. Yeah, well, our work was actually based on work that was done by Paloma Gian Grande, which she actually developed this strategy which was to, um, she, she used an aptamer to pr a prostate surface antigen that was linked to a small interfering RNA. And she found it, got, it was effective at, at, at delivering the RNA into the cytoplasm. The okay. truth is nobody really knows how uh, RNA, so the big bottleneck is for de the delivery uh, problem is the major obstacle to RNA drugs and one of most of the methods that people have designed the RNA might get endocytose but it stays in the endosome and never gets in, out of the endosome into the cytoplasm and mm. why um, this strategy works and why uh, we get very good gene silencing we're, we're trying to figure out Okay. So well, we, we don't really know how most drugs work, so it's in good company there. <laughs> how does the aptamer work now? How, how long are these typically these RNA molecules? Well, there were about 100 um, nucleotides in, in length. Mm -hmm. we, we actually have been able to make a smaller version more recently that seems to work, but... Um, what we do is we we actually in vitro transcribe the RNA in our lab um, as the aptamer and one part of the siRNA, the inactive or sense strand, and then we 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 synthesize it with using um, modified bases uh, that are fluorinated, and that makes them very stable. Um, to, they're not degraded by RNAs in the in the body. In fact, the RNA that we used uh, is not degraded at all after 36 hours in vaginal fluid. And then we take that single strand and we anneal it to the um, active uh, complementary uh, siRNA strand, which is the active strand. We purify it and um, then we we actually just put it in uh, 
and uh, PBS and saline solution uh, for, for these experiments. So when you select aptamers, you're selecting for the RNA to bind to your to your protein of interest, right? Right. And yes. So we didn't select it. We actually found, so we found an aptamer that was that was selected in the nineties uh, for somebody who wanted to use the aptamer as a drug against for HIV mm -hmm. to block CD4. Um, Finding. Okay, so this had already been identified, this particular okay. aptamer, yeah. So the idea is that the RNA is folding in such a way that it fits into the CD4 molecule, right? That's correct. And it has pretty good affinity? Yeah, we're talking about, I don't know the, I don't recall the exact affinity, but generally these aptamers, they have, uh, say, nanomolar affinity, mm -hmm. like, like an antibody, very high. Right, it's like it's like an antibody, but it's made out of nucleic acids instead of amino acids. Right, and, so and just, that has, just has an advantage because it's it, and it's likely to be uh, not aminogenic. Just for the uninitiated out there, uh, correct me if I've got this wrong, but the way these are made is to start out with a a random a pool of random sequence RNA molecules, and then bind them to the candidate target and some at at random out of the pool uh, uh, there will be something that will bind and then you can purify that because it's bound to the target and amplify it uh, because it's got primer binding sites on the end you've constructed that way and then go through that multiple cycles until you wind up out of the random pool amplifying something that was in there to start with okay uh, that uh, by chance folds properly to bind the target protein. And you can make these against virtually anything, right? In principle, yes. And, you know, it's a lot of rounds of selection, often 20, 20 uh, rounds. And you can also make sure that the aptamer doesn't bind to things you don't want it to bind to. So you right. can do what we call positive selection or negative selection. Right, you basically simulate the immune system with a with an RNA version. Right. And attaching the aptamer to the siRNA does not interfere with the siRNA's activity, right? That's correct. I mean, I think that you have to you you have to take some care with your design mm -hmm. to make sure that the secondary structure of the whole chimeric RNA doesn't interfere with the folding of the aptamer piece. So you've shown in cell cultures that this particular uh, siRNA aptamer against CD4 is effective in reducing levels of the protein, right? Yes. The, the, we, we showed that we could, with different siRNAs, uh, knock down the expression of, of whatever protein we were targeting. And if you infect these cells with HIV, what, what's the outcome? We, we can very effectively block HIV um, infection in vitro if we knock down either uh, CCR5, which is the co-receptor mm -hmm. that's used by HIV during sexual transmission, or if we knock down a viral gene. Um, so in, in this study, we, we knocked down either GAG or VIF, two viral, two viral genes. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, in developing a microbicide, you'd probably apply both of those approaches, right, to, to hit it both ways so it, the receptors knock down as well as uh, HIV genes when they get into the cell? Yeah, uh, we sort of took our approach from sort of the, the approach that's used for antiviral drug therapy, where a cocktail is much more effective than, than targeting one part of the virus at a time. And the advantage of of going against CCR5 is that uh, that if if you target just viral genes, there's always the danger that the virus will mutate to become resistant. Whereas mm -hmm. if you knock down the receptor, that's not going to mutate. But we we are ch in the past the the sequences that we use for GAG and VIF, we had we had identified at least for VIF sequences in the virus that are 
conserved um, throughout um, the world in the different clades of HIV. So um, the same sequence is active against viruses in China, Africa, the US, and any virus we, tr we tried about 10. Uh, viruses that we the same sequence was able to suppress HIV. Right, then you move to cervical vaginal explants. Could you could you tell us what that is? Right. So basically, we get uh, tissue from normal um, genital tissue from women who are undergoing hysterectomy, mm -hmm. and uh, we cut it up into small pieces about three millimeters in diameter. And we uh, uh, put those pieces into agarose with the epithelial surface facing up. So it, it's sort of like it's a tissue explant that mimics uh, the uh, mucosal surface of the vagina. And then we can um, we can put the the agarose plugs into medium. We can add. Uh, siRNAs, we can infect those explants with virus and then see, read out how much viral replication there is by um, harvesting the, the medium and measuring the production of mm. HIV uh, proteins. So is the epithelial surface of these explants, sort of, I'm trying to visualize what this would look like. Is the epithelial surface of the explants more or less flush with the surface of the agarose, so it's not completely embedded in the agarose? Right. It, you have the, the area about three millimeters by three millimeters of the surface that's exposed to the medium. Okay. And then you can but, apply things to that. Okay. So when you, when you infect these explants with HIV, do you know... Uh, in which cells are the virus is replicating? Yes, so we we can um, isolate. We, so we can take the explants and we can digest the tissue with collagenase, which like breaks up the um, the um, the connective uh, tissue between the cells and isolate different cell populations, and then we can use flow cytometry to analyze different populations of CD4 cells mm -hmm. or other cells in the tissue. And we can stain um, the cells for HIV um, P24 antigen and look by flow cytometry and see which cells are infected, mm -hmm. how much infection there is. And we can also look at the the genes that we're silencing, like CCR5, and see that, in fact, we uh, effectively knock down those genes. So is it predominantly CD4 positive cells that are infected in these explants? It's only CD4 positive cells. Mm -hmm. And the effect of the siRNA aptamer is substantial in this model? Yes, we can very efficiently... Um, uh, suppress um, viral replication. If, have, have you ever tried just using uh, siRNAs against uh, viral uh, viral RNAs? And, and if so, do you get uh, resistance by mutation? Uh, we haven't done that, but um, I forget who did. But the, yeah, if you um, we we. Um, we tried with these conserved, this conserved sequence. We did not see the development of resistance, mm -hmm. but um, with sequences that are not conserved, you do begin to develop uh, mutations. Right. Certainly in other viruses where this has been done, I'm thinking of polio, you, right. can, you, you can readily get um, mutations that escape the siRNA uh, degradation. Yeah, Ra Rao Landino uh, showed that right. a decade ago. Yep. So then you move to a humanized mouse model to test this. That's correct. And so how does that work? How do you humanize a mice, a mouse, so that it can be infected with uh, HIV? Okay. So uh, basically, uh, these mice are—it's uh, really a new, relatively new technology. Uh, 
where you take a uh, profoundly immunodeficient mouse that uh, a nod skid mouse that's also lacking the common uh, gamma chain and you uh, irradiate it and uh, basically do a transplant with, uh, it's called the BLT mouse, bone marrow, liver, and thymus. Uh, you uh, irradiate the mouse and implant CD34 positive hematopoietic stem cells uh, from a human fetus together with uh, fetal liver cells and you implant under the kidney capsule a small piece of the fetal thymus. And these mice uh, develop uh, a human immune system. So about half of their hematopoietic cells are of human origin and all of their lymphocytes are human. And you, what's amazing is that you can infect these mice by various routes, uh, uh, intravenously or rectally or vaginally, just like human transmission with HIV. And the, um, the infection proceeds in these mice. Uh, it, it reproduces what, uh, what happens in people to an amazing extent. So um, the dynamics of the virus, the changes in the CD4 cell counts, the, the details of the immune response to the virus uh, mimic what's happening in infected people. It's closer to what happens in infected children, uh, which makes sense because you're dealing with a, an immune system that that's basically hasn't seen antigens before. It's uh, what we call naive. Right. But these must be very difficult mice to work with. They are. <laughs> it, co it costs about, you know, we, 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 we get the mice from a group at MGH that's led by Andy Lester and Andy, Andy Tager. Um, it costs about a thousand dollars to make each mouse. It's technically very challenging, um, uh, but um, they work very well. And you know, I think it's it's a very very useful model uh, for HIV because, uh, well, before this there wasn't a small animal model. I've I've done a fair amount of work in. Uh, vaccine development and the surrogate is uh, so first of all vaccines that were that looked really good in mice in mouse immunology often didn't pan out when they were tried in humans and then the surrogate of the of the primates uh, like rhesus macaques those are even more expensive mm -hmm. and a lot of the heterogeneity um, from macaque to macaque. What's really nice about these mice is that uh, you can make about 30 mice from a single donor. So within each experiment, the, the experimental uh, variation within a group is very small. You can really tell what's going on. Uh, 30 mice in an experiment at 1,000 bucks a piece, that's an expensive experiment. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Um, but it's cheaper than doing it with 30 monkeys. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Or, th you, or 30 medical students. <laughs> right. So uh, so it might cost $30,000 for 30 uh, mice, but it would cost um, half a million dollars to do an experiment like that with monkeys. And usually what you don't get 30 monkeys. You have to sort of use fewer monkeys than you really should, and then often you don't get... Mm. Uh, do these mice, once they're uh, constructed, live a, a relatively normal life if you leave them alone? Well, um, so there are two varieties of these BLT mice. There's, um, there's, you can either uh, perform the transplant on nod skid mice or on these nod skid common gamma chain uh, knockout mice. And the the nod skid mice. Uh, have a very high frequency of developing eventually graft versus host disease. So, mm -hmm. um, okay. after a while, they die. Uh, the the 
nuts get come in gamma chain mice live longer. I don't know exactly how long <laughs> because we're always using them. Uh, right. I think BLT mice is an unfortunate name. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> They're not kosher. <laughs> right. <laughs> so how do you test your aptamer siRNA construct in these animals? Yeah, so what, what we did was um, we, uh, once the transplant was stable and we had about uh, at least 50% of the blood cells were human, we, we instilled the siRNA uh, aptamer chimeras into the vagina of mice. We did it twice um, because sometimes we're, we're, we're concerned that we wouldn't get um, consistent delivery by a single injection. Um, and then we, after, so we, we would in, instill the RNAs on day one, day one, the next day, and then the following day we would uh, challenge mm -hmm. uh, with HIV. And what happens in that case? What's the effect on viral production? I guess that's what you measure, viral production. Yeah, we measured uh, the, the viral antigen in the blood, the mm -hmm. viral RNA, which is a more sensitive assay. And we also measured the CD4 and CD8 counts. So we, we did the measurements that you would do in mm -hmm. a human. And uh, we got amazing protection with the chimeric RNAs. So... Um, all of the, half of the mice, the control mice died, and they all developed a profound immunodeficiency. And we could detect uh, HIV virus in the blood very readily. But in the aptamer RNA uh, treated mice, uh, we couldn't detect the P24 antigen, which is the protein measure of, of the virus in any mice. In uh, two mice, we had transient, very tiny blips in HIV RNA, but two mice we had none. And all of the treated mice uh, maintained their CD4 counts at completely normal mm -hmm. levels. They were, uh, I thought the protection was pretty amazing, especially since it was the first thing. We didn't optimize anything. It was the first experiment. So how did, how did you decide how much of the siRNA to deliver? So uh, before that, we've done an exper a dose response experiment to look at, at silencing in the genital tract uh -huh. uh, of CCR5. And are the amounts that you used and with which you, you achieved good protection, are those pharmacologically reasonable levels? Yeah, very much so. Um, that We used um, picomolar concentrations of the drug. Mm. So, I mean, that's one of the advantages of these. Uh, small RNAs. I, I think they're, they're they have all the properties that you would want for a drug. And as far as you can tell, there are no side effects. Right. So we looked for uh, we looked at the surface of the epithelium. We looked to, to see whether we activated any um, off-target effects like interferons or inflammation or infiltration of inflammatory cells into the tissue mm -hmm. and we didn't see any evidence of that. So have you had an opportunity yet to mess around with the actual regimen like how long before you can uh, add the siRNA or whether it's effective if you, I realize you're developing this as a prophylaxis but it would be interesting to know if you could actually add the HIV first and then this and how long after you could do that. Have you done any yeah. of those experiments? We've just started. So what we've found is that the gene silencing, uh, it looks, this is very preliminary, but it, it looks like it lasts for as long as we looked, which is about nine days. Mm -hmm. So I think that's very encouraging. Mm -hmm. But we haven't done any viral challenge yet. Okay. So by viral challenge, you would... Another, you mean treat, wait a certain amount of time, and then infect? That's right. Okay. Like we did for the herpes study, where we found we could get protection even after the fact mm -hmm. or a week uh, later. Okay. So what, what do you have to do next in order to put this into people? 
Well, we have to, I think one, one of the important things would be to figure out a way of formulating mm-hmm. uh, RNA into a gel so that it wouldn't, you need to have uh, a material that's retained in the genital tract. Mm-hmm. Um, I think to make it into a, something that we could actually do clinical studies, it would be good to get a commercial partner. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> right. Right. It's very hard to do drug development in academia. I have a nice grant from the NIH to develop this, but it's to actually go to clinical trials. I, I would like to partner. Do you have to have do, you, go ahead? Have Dan. you gotten any commercial? And when we talked a year and a half ago, you said that there wasn't a whole lot of commercial interest in this because of the track record of, uh, of previous microbicides. But has that changed at all? Has there, has there been any movement toward companies investing in this sort of thing? Um, no, but I've been, uh, I've been talking to some uh, people, uh, venture capitalists mm-hmm. and, um, and companies that actually are very interested. They're interested in the Aptamer RNAi technology, whether they would actually be interested in using. So our reagent could, in principle, be used to treat a a variety of um, immune-mediated diseases, like Mm -hmm. autoimmunity, transplant rejection. So, uh, what I found in the past and I'm finding now is that it might be possible to get, I think it will, I'm optimistic at the present time that it'll be possible to find someone interested in developing the Aptamer RNA uh, technology into a drug. Um, but whether I can convince them to develop it for as a microbicide, I'm not sure. But if I have, what I think is that I, if I can get a company interested in the technology, then perhaps with NIH support, I might be able to move that project into phase one clinical trial. Right. This this also seems like something that might interest, say, the Gates Foundation or other other organizations that focus on um, uh, poor countries' disease problems, because this would be this is this is the type of product that people have been clamoring for in that environment for a long time. One would hope. I mean, when I when I did the herpes study, I calculated uh, how much each dose would cost for herpes. I haven't done the same calculation for HIV, but um, I think at that time it was about eight dollars per administration, and if you have to administer something every week or two, that that's a that's actually a very feasible. Real cost. I mean, I'm, the the actual cost of drugs has very little to do with the real cost of manufacturing. Right. The uh, trials must be huge because you must like go to a high risk population and then uh, sort of assess uh, versus a control group of some sort the HIV infection rate. Is that how you do this? Yeah, that you you would have to look at a high risk population and. Uh, that's how you do it. <laughs> yeah, just as a as an example, the right about the time I did the piece for Nature Medicine, there'd been a a big microbicide trial that was ten thousand women in four okay. different countries um, trying uh, anti anti HIV um, microbicide, and uh, that it failed. But you know, huge huge trial, and that's the way these things have to be done. Right. Yeah. Well, you start with you know. Uh, small numbers of patients to look at safety and, right. and uh, whether the drug is doing what you think it should be doing before you go to those big trials. But, right, the efficacy yeah. trial is what has to be huge. Yeah, yeah. the other one, to, to get the, the trials before that involve tens or twenty, right. or that, that size uh, study. When did you start this work? Well, I, okay, so it's really been a decade that I've been working on this. So uh, I got involved in RNA interference um, before it was, 
published uh, that RNA interference worked in mammals. So in 2001, Tom Tuchel wrote a paper in which he showed for the first time that RNA interference works in mammalian cells. And be before that paper came out, I, I was approached by a postdoc in Phil Sharp's lab, uh, Carl Novena. He came to me and he said, do you think you could get this to work for uh, HIV? And we worked together, we got it to work. And that was, I think our paper was in 2002. And then um, we were the first to show that you could use small RNAs as a drug in, in a mouse in any disease where we were able to block death from hepatitis. So that was sort of the first in vivo study. And then I, we found in vitro that we could knock down CCR5 that we could knock it down for weeks at a time uh, in vitro. And uh, at that point, I decided that, and that was about, I don't know, 2004, 2005, that uh, this might be a really uh, good idea for a microbicide. So our first step was the herpes um, study. And that we first published in 2006, but getting gene silencing in lymphocytes is really difficult. Even in the laboratory, you can't transfect lymphocytes. You have to use uh, electroporation to trans, um, transfect lymphocytes, which is something you couldn't do in vivo. Mm. So, you know, we've been really working hard to try to figure out a way of of getting RNAs into lymphocytes. And, and so this is really a decade I've been uh, working on this. It has all the elements of, you know, the finished product or what uh, the, where it stands now. You know, if I read it in a sci-fi novel, I would say, yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, as you describe the progression of the ideas, yeah, it makes a certain, it makes, there's a logical progression and it makes sense, but uh, just um, the the finished technology is uh, really astonishing. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I've heard okay. that. I've heard that one. Who said that? I. It's um, one of the great sci-fi authors, I think. Yeah. Was it Heinlein? Yeah, it might be. Okay. Might have been. It's a great story. It's very impressive, Great story. and I think it's a really nice example of how you take fundamental observations and translate it to something that can be useful for people. Yeah, well, I think uh, molecular biology is incredible these days, and the opportunities for doing something for human health by using all the new tools yeah. and uh, understanding our it's pretty exciting. It's great. I think it's a great story, and uh, um, I want to thank you for spending the time to tell us about it. Well, thank you for your interest. Yeah, pleasure. thank we'll, you. When it, uh, when it goes into people, we'll be back to talk to you again. Okay, it's a deal. Good luck. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> Bye. Bye. And take care. Bye. Okay. It's interesting stuff. Great yeah. stuff. Holy Very By the way, it was Ar Arthur C. Clarke. I just Googled the quote. Ah. That would make sense. I yeah, like that better yeah. than Einlein. It is okay. um, the re the results are very impressive. When you yeah, that paper. Part, really impressive. I and this is not something that I was aware of until you brought it to our attention, Alan. So thank you. Yeah. And and I uh, I think um, it's a good example of you got to keep supporting basic stuff, right? Yep. I yep. Mean, RNAi came out of nowhere. But also an example. I mean, I've uh, I'm looking ahead here because I was looking at your pick earlier, Vincent. Mm -hmm. But it's also an example of, I mean, she says there's a struggle here in getting support for taking this uh, into clinical trials. And, and that's understandable. It's a pretty far out idea. And the clinical trials are enormously expensive. So there has to be some, some mechanism to uh, move this stuff forward, uh, mm -hmm. some funding mechanism to help the translation of this to uh, some clinical application. Yeah. Yeah, and as as I said in the Nature Medicine article, um, this uh, this is a field that has been rife with failures. Um, mm -hmm. HIV microbicides. People have been working on it for decades, 
in various approaches, and most of the other, the other approaches. Judy mentioned the tenofovir, which finally showed some efficacy, but previous ones had um, had really just not panned out at all. And uh, and as we were talking about, you know, by the time you get to the point of figuring that out, you funded a ten thousand patient trial that's scattered in all these sites over the it's hundreds of millions of dollars in, and then you find out the thing doesn't work. So um, so investors are skittish of this right. sort of. Thing. Makes sense. Really nice. Well, I hope it works. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's do some email. Uh, the uh, The first one is actually a tweet from Twitter, which uh, I noticed just yesterday. Uh, it's from La Franche Fille. And she writes, French, listen to your very cool podcast. So I can confirm Mimi is French. Excellent. <laughs> Alan and I oh. had this discussion last time, right? That's right. So there you go. Love it. They like us in France. Very good. Yeah, us and Jerry Lewis. <laughs> Next one is from Peter from Sydney, Australia. Regarding the podcasting advice from the fellow in Israel, explain stuff in the beginning of the episode. That's what the pause button and Google are for. Edit or don't edit the episodes. Don't. It's more time wasted, and the collegial feel will disappear. At the moment, the TWIV experience is like we are sitting at the table in Vincent's office. In fact, I was in hospital recovering from acute pancreatitis when I listened to CSI Virology, episode 110, on my speaker iPhone. While listening, every now and then I would laugh or make audible comment. The nurses in the station outside my room door were wondering, who is this patient who is having conversations with these American doctors, scientists, about viruses and arsenic-eating bacteria? They even contrived to send a senior nurse into my room to try and figure out what was going on. Thus, the podcast is so conversational, it fooled them into thinking I was in on some sort of conference call, and that is what makes your podcast stand well out from the crowd, as well as the content, of course. P.S. I did not enlighten them as to what was going on, but vicariously enjoyed being a man of mystery as they speculated on who I could be. Grin. Excellent. The great story. Awesome. I love it. Yeah, we do. As, it. Pe as Peter from Australia. Yeah. Thanks, Peter. We appreciate it. Well, that's the idea. It's a conversation. Yeah. So we don't want to edit it. So it's not. All right. The next one's from Casey. I've been saving this for you for weeks, Rich. No, this is good. I am glad that TWIV evolved into TWIP, which evolved into TWIM. I love listening to all three while I am walking, since I cannot run due to a knee injury during a half marathon. No worries about safety. I walk on a no-vehicle crossing trail at a park. Just listen to the TWIM episode regarding the smallpox vaccine and military members. I think that must be TWIV. I, no? think, it, I, think, I think it was a TWIV episode. Yeah. 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 As a member of the Army Medical Service Corps and also having received the smallpox vaccine, I can tell you a lot of soldiers do not fully understand the vaccine. When I received my vaccine, we were herded into a room. A nurse stood in the front and briefed us on the numerous vaccines we were to receive along with the whole process for medical clearance station at the Soldiers Readiness Program. SRP. The SRP is a program to ensure soldiers are medically ready to deploy to various combat zones. In my case, Iraq. Iraq, not Iraq. Iraq. Okay. This occurs usually in a day with many other training events. The focus of the soldiers can be very low during this process. Although they briefed us on the hazards of the smallpox vaccine, it is easy to understand that all of the information was glossed over by many of the soldiers. Nearly all soldiers do not have the microbiology understanding as you and I do. Therefore, they do not understand that touching the site once and lightly can spread the virus. A key sentence in here that I really love is, the focus of the soldiers can be very low during this process. <laughs> I can imagine. They're all being herded into this room and shot up with all kinds of stuff and talked to, and they're about to ship out to a combat zone. My focus would be low, too. Yes. Yeah, and I hope their focus is higher in the combat zone itself. Yeah, I yeah. can imagine it is. Yeah. The vaccine site takes about 40 days to fully heal with the infectious scab falling off at around day 30. Mine fell off at day 35. Throughout this time, soldiers, 
I like how he capitalizes soldiers. Yes, throughout, yeah. soldiers so cool. capitalize. Can't forget cool. the information they have received and can forget that the stab is infectious. This is especially true as most people understand that a scab in general is part of the healing process and is not infectious. Furthermore, the site can be very itchy for some. I remember just wanting to scratch it because it was so bad at times. The information provided to us with the vaccine is to change the Band-Aid daily. When taking a shower, do not dry the site with a towel. Rather, let it air dry and then cover it with a new Band-Aid. Any contact such as wrestling, hand-to-hand, combat, or other forms of physical contact are prohibited until the scab falls off. I must admit that I am 100% a nerd. Figuring that I would receive the vaccine once in my life, I decided to document the site every day. I recorded 42 days of the vaccine process with photos each day. I attached photos of my arm, no HIPAA violation, of course, at day 4, 11, 14 with the sunken center, 20, 35 when the scab fell off, and 36. I do apologize for the clarity of the images. I wish I would have had an object to judge the size of the infection, but I was taking these photos myself. Thank you, and keep up the good work. The photos are great. You did yeah. a good job, actually. I presume, we could, I presume we could post these, right? Well, it's not a HIPAA violation. He gave them to us. <laughs> yeah, he has. you have the patient's consent. Okay. Yeah, there was one here I thought uh, that I didn't quite understand that might be out of, uh, out of order, but we can talk about that. At any rate, it's okay. Just take a, take a selection. They're really, uh, they're really terrific. Yeah. It shows nice the whole process. Uh, he's, got them, he's got them dated, yeah. Oh, yeah. Very nice. There you go. Thanks, Casey. That's great. Sorry it took us so long to read it, but we were waiting for Rich. This can't be done without Rich Condit. Well, right. we did. We we questioned the the case that we had before. We've had several cases where um, we've highlighted usually MMWR articles where uh, people in the military are vaccinated and they uh, accidentally transfer a virus to somebody that they have contact with. And we've uh, questioned, yeah. uh, you know, how that could happen. And clearly from this, they are given appropriate instructions, but the circumstances are, are, are such that uh, that may very well not sink in. It's, it's perfectly understandable. Yep. Yeah. All right. The next one is from Lance. We also save this for you, Rich. Right. Dear Vincent Allen and Rich, I would like to mildly disagree with you on hepatitis B vaccine as discussed on TWIV 130. The risk of an infant acquiring hepatitis B if they are in a low-risk population is extremely low and therefore their chance of passing it on also very low indeed. In fact, the chance is so low that in some countries such as the UK where I come from, the relevant authorities don't recommend routine hepatitis B vaccination. See below for two links to the UK Department of Health recommendations on routine vaccination, which don't include hepatitis B. The public health benefit of hepatitis B vaccine in low-risk populations is very different from vaccines such as measles, polio, and influenza, which are much more likely to occur and to be transmitted, e.g. 14,500 cases of measles in France in the last three years, according to today's ProMed Mail. I felt that you didn't do full justice to the difference between Hep B and some of the more infectious childhood illnesses. All that only applies to low-risk populations, and in the UK, people from areas or communities of high prevalence or for some other reason at high risk are vaccinated against and screened for Hep B. Indeed, in my own practice, infectious diseases, we do a lot of bloodborne virus work and vaccinate a lot in groups such as HIV positive, HCV positive, etc., Having said that, my own view would actually be that if the public health authorities have taken a decision that universal Hep B vaccine should be used, then physicians and the public should abide by that decision. Certainly, if I had children, I would jump at the chance to have them vaccinated against Hep B if the opportunity was there. I just wanted to make the point that someone in a low-risk group refusing Hep B vaccine is not in the same league as, for example, refusing MMR, even if the reason is unfounded. Keep up the great work. I really enjoy all your podcasts, and I continue to learn a lot. That's from Lance, who's over in the UK. Well, he's right. The circumstances are different, okay? I mean, in terms of uh, the the uh, probability of infection, and I suppose the risk, and you can identify low-risk groups. 
<clears throat> but this is, we and we had some discussion of this when we were when we were doing it. I mean, he's right from the point of view that theoretically, at least, there is a there is a difference uh, between uh, measles and the measles vaccine and hepatitis B and the hepatitis B vaccine that I think he uh, uh, pretty clearly describes. This inspired me to look for sort of what the rationale was for immunizing uh, everybody. And this is a Google search. This is about the best thing I could find, uh, a, a link to about.com, an article written by uh, a doctor named Vincent Ianelli. Um, they say these articles are, the content is reviewed by the Medical Review Board. Uh, I don't know how to vouch for this, but it seems like a pretty intelligent analysis consistent with my own sort of experience. And he says, according to the CDC, giving a birth dose of hepatitis B vaccine is a good idea because it provides a safety net to prevent perinatal infection among infants born to uh, uh, HBV positive mothers who are not identified because of errors in the testing. The birth dose provides early protection to infants at risk for infection. The infants who get a birth dose of hepatitis B have higher rates of on-time completion of the whole series, uh, and it reduces the risk uh, that a child could get hep B later in uh, childhood. Um, they point out, too, a point I think I made is that if you do get infected as an infant, the likelihood that you will be uh, get chronic uh, HBV is uh, up to 90%, and that can lead to hepatocellular uh, carcinoma. Um, I think the probably the important thing is here on the bottom. The alternative to universal immunization and giving the hepatitis B vaccine to all newborns would be simply to target high-risk newborns and other people who are at high risk for infections. Unfortunately, health experts tried that when the hepatitis B vaccine first came out and it didn't work. It wasn't until after universal immunization program for hepatitis B vaccine began that the rate of new hepatitis B infections in children began to drop. So basically, hmm. the mandatory universal uh, coverage gets everybody. Nobody falls through the cracks, yeah, okay? Yeah. And in terms of, and, 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 and that's worth it. And it's also worth pointing out that as vaccines go, this is, the safest you can get. There's no virus or anything in this. It's just a protein. Right. Okay? Right. And this is a this is a relatively recently developed vaccine. Um, so in terms of the technology behind it, this is pretty current. Right. Um, which is, you know, some people complain that well, this some such and such vaccine has been around since the <clears throat> 50s. So it can't be modern. Um, but uh, you know, this is uh, this is a darn good vaccine, and even if you're in a so-called low-risk group or you think you're in a low-risk group, this is what I would call a low-risk, high-consequence event, Yes, getting right. hepatitis B, uh, especially, as you just pointed out, Rich, getting it as a kid. Um, right. That's a really, really bad thing, and there's a really, really good vaccine to prevent it, so what was the question? You know, It really seems so, like this is the way to go. His, his point is... You know, his point is 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 accurate, but I appreciate the fact that he says, having said that, uh, I vaccinate my kids, okay? Right. And so it's not as if he objects to it. And there's uh, it's, it's a good motivation to review the reasons for doing this. I think they're well thought out. Right. And he does raise a good point that this is not quite in the same league as not people refusing, refusing right. MMR, where right. it's not a low-risk event. It's a, it's a pretty getting to be a higher risk event right yeah I, I just think that being selective is a problem you have to, if if the public health yes. authorities say you, you need to take this as he says you should take it and right not try and justify it then right. you get into you, trouble. you know if you have if you have questions about the rationale it's not that we should just reflexively do whatever the government tells us i, I don't think any of us are making that argument it's uh, you can look to the science and say well what are the reasons for this and when you look to the reasons for it you find out there there's a pretty good rationale for this right well, if I remember the original listener who wrote about this, she said she did look into it and decided that her child wasn't at risk. And she just delayed it. But the the scary thing there was that her pediatrician agreed with her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't know. You, It's it's difficult. I don't think you should second guess uh, authorities who have made these decisions unless you're really sure. Yeah. You can ask them. Certainly you should ask them why. You know? Yes. Yeah, I agree.
Yeah, but the the rationale is out there, easily obtainable. Yeah, you know, even right. if you just go to the CDC website, they they spell it out and they give you the opportunity to drill down to to more information and, yeah. and uh, yeah. All right, that's good. Thank you, Lance. And now I have a few emails from my virology class, which ended back in May. And as extra credit, I said, send in a, qu a question to TWIV and here are a couple of them. Uh, one is from Komal, who writes, I had a question regarding TWIV episode 131, a rheostat for cancer. Can rheovirus therapy also be effective against hematologic cancers like leukemias, or would it only work for solid tumors? So I asked Brad Thompson, who we had on TWIV 131. He wrote, Rio works well in the lab against leukemias. We are discussing with the National Cancer Institute a request by them to run a Rio study on leukemia. Good question. Cool. And next one is from Srila. I am curious to know if scientific reporting also brings into picture a vast majority of public engagement wherein a variety of stakeholders can participate in a discourse in a way that the plurality of views notifies research priorities and scientific policies. Also, does the lack of proper scientific reporting advocate the mushrooming of cafes, cafe scientifique, where no scientists are really involved, but it is the laypersons who have a deep desire to know more about the science discuss amongst themselves is the aim achieved in the end that of getting erudite knowledge of science and technology into people i think alan should try that one i'm yeah, not I'm uh, uh, yeah i'm kind of wading into this there's a the the phraseology is a little bit difficult here <laughs> um so i guess the idea is uh can can the uh uh the public grassroots efforts like these cafes scientifiques and um uh and people just um participating themselves uh can that get around the problem of uh of public engagement of science um and i think to some extent that does help address it um the issue that i have with with people saying well you know that that takes care of science education people can just go on the internet and, and learn what they need to um, I don't think that's quite what's being said here, but uh, but I have heard that argument. You know that this will make up for the shortcomings in uh, in science coverage and in education. And the difficulty is that you're dealing with self-selected groups mm. of people who who are interested in science. So the listeners of TWIV or the people who go to a scientific cafe uh, discussion somewhere or or go online to read about science and the you know in the original publications, those are the people who would have been doing that anyway. Um, the, the people who we need to worry about greater scientific literacy in are the ones who aren't paying attention, the ones who, um, you know, got through a mediocre education and, and forgot it, and now they're going about their lives as, uh, as lawyers or plumbers or whatever it is that they're doing, and they just don't think that science matters in their lives. Um, and those are the folks who I think are are much harder to reach and uh, um, but who have a lot of impact as voters and as taxpayers and as uh, as advocates of their own views um, so I, I think we need both approaches I think we need good scientific um, reporting and explanation um, and I think it's also great that there are these grassroots efforts of people just uh, just getting involved and learning about science on their own uh, I think the first part of this question is also, I think, it's also, um, to what extent does scientific reporting facilitate um, the communication of research priorities or scientific policies? I mean, are the public being heard or should they be heard in terms of uh, research priorities, scientific policies, and, and, and does reporting, science reporting play a role there? Okay. Yeah, I, I think, um, well, depending on the issue, the public is often heard quite loudly um, on scientific priorities. Uh, there, there are certain fields that, uh, you know, stem cell research, this is, right. this is an issue where people who have no scientific background have obviously weighed in very heavily on particular sides of that debate. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't think that that's necessarily a positive step, but... It is, I would agree that the people 
the people who are paying the taxes and who are underwriting the government-funded research, at least, um, certainly have a right to uh, to have some kind of a voice in how those priorities are set, and uh, um, and that's appropriate. Um, the issue is that they have to also be given the tools to make intelligent decisions about that. Right. And I, that's what I was getting at with with education and and science reporting. You know, we we really need to be more concerned about the people who are not interested in science because they don't have to be interested, but they do have to understand how it works in order to make intelligent decisions in their daily lives and as um, and as members of the public when these mm-hmm. priorities come up. I think there has been a, um, a shift in in the way NIH is supporting science over the last, I don't know, 15 years where a more um, translational or applied research has been demanded as a way of justifying investment. So in the old days, you could scientists could do whatever they wanted, and that often resulted in very interesting findings. But mm-hmm. now the idea is up front, you have to tell us how it's going to benefit human health. Right. And that had a political origin, I think. Sure. And I, I don't think that's entirely good. I think you have to have a good balance of both. Right. I agree. You yes. know, you have to support research on flies and worms and plants, et cetera, in addition to direct work on human diseases. Right. And when you have members of Congress who are pointing to a, a research project that involved shrimp on treadmills and saying, ha ha, isn't that funny? Because they don't understand the importance of that yeah, exactly. in, in the stability of global fisheries, which is where we get a lot of our food. Um, <laughs> they, sure. yeah. to, people people do need to um, be able to understand the connections and uh, because a lot of them are going to end up making decisions that will profoundly affect the future of, the, of, uh, of all of us. Exactly, exactly. All right, the next one is from H. I forgot his first name and don't want to mention his or her last name. When a new virus emerges, when do governments decide to intervene, e.g. developing a vaccine against it? Is there a specified mortality rate or number of infected people that is used as a criterion? 12,382. 12, <laughs> good, good, Alan. Let's take an example. So HIV, AIDS uh, develops in the 80s. And the cases pile up more and more, thousands and thousands. They isolate a virus, and over the first four or five years of research, it becomes clear that this is a globally prevalent infection, and it's growing every year. So then you realize you need to make a vaccine against it, right? It becomes clear at some point. In contrast to, say, Ebola, which causes a sporadic outbreak here or there and doesn't spread among people, you don't need a vaccine. Right. Against but it's that. on a case by case basis, really. Yes. Yeah. There's no specified number. Yeah, and it's and it's a lot of factors besides mortality rate. Um, as you pointed out, Vincent Ebola has killed thousands of people over the years, but it's these sporadic outbreaks, and it doesn't seem to be terribly well transmitted, and it doesn't get established. Um, so yeah, there's research on it, and that's appropriate, but not at the same level as HIV which is, is transmitted through a variety of mechanisms and is global and is, is killing millions of people every year. Um, so it's, it's a whole set of criteria that has to be looked at right. um, before, before somebody yep. decides it's worth acting on. All right, one more. And I forgot who's this, who this is from. I didn't write it down. Oh. Oh, dear. Well, I will put it in the notes. Uh, TWIV 110, while it is clear that phylogenetic analyses of HIV can be extremely useful in solving criminal cases of sexual crimes, is it fair to consider someone with the disease a deadly weapon? TWIV 110 was about uh, that case where the two individuals spread right. HIV on per- on intentionally to many, many women, right? And right. It was a criminal trial involved. Criminalization of HIV potentially places those who test positive at risk for further discrimination and social prejudice. By classifying a subset of the population as inherently dangerous, what kinds of societal impacts would this have on disease control? Would HIV-positive individuals decrease or increase? Using it maliciously is what makes someone— Wait a minute, that's your comment. I'm sorry. Yeah, I commented at the end of this. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, so my uh, usual disclaimer, I'm not an attorney, but— 
my understanding is uh, possession of a deadly weapon as a as a charge um, isn't quite what you think. It's possessing a deadly weapon is not necessarily a crime. You can own in many many states or most states you can own a gun legally. Um, you can own knives. I've got them in my kitchen. Uh, socks, guitar strings, you know, all sorts of things can be deadly weapons. Possessing them is not criminal, um, but using it maliciously is what makes it criminal. So this charge of, of assault with a deadly weapon uh, was based on these individuals maliciously spreading HIV. And certainly I think what they did was criminal, um, but not because they were infected with HIV. What they did was criminal because they were deliberately and maliciously spreading a deadly virus. Right. right. So that's what the, what the basis of the case was. It, what else are you going to charge them with? Right. This there is what go. the law offers. So the charge was assault with a deadly weapon, um, which is as close as we could get, I guess, in legal terminology to um, deliberate spread of, a, of an infectious disease. Right. And I think a lot of, a lot of thought has been put into um, how HIV-positive individuals are characterized uh, in, 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 yes. in society uh, because this has been a problem. Uh, in particular, if you... Uh, if you discriminate in any way against uh, people who are HIV positive, the, uh, I would think that the tendency, I don't have any data for this, but I would think that the tendency would be, uh, if anything, to uh, increase um, the HIV positive population because people aren't going to want to uh, expose themselves as HIV positive. And, you know, right. uh, the only, the, a, a, a component of uh, keeping the disease in check is uh, understanding who's infected and who's uh, not and taking appropriate precautions against spread. Yeah, and stigmatizing it clearly is not, <clears throat> is not the appropriate response. No, because absolutely. In, reason, in places where that's been done, it's been an abysmal failure. Mm -hmm. um, and they, you, know, you see some of the highest HIV infection rates in places where there's the greatest stigma about, uh, about the disease. So, yeah, I'm, I'm certainly not agreeing with the notion that, uh, that we should criminalize HIV patients. Uh, these people are, if they've, they've just gotten the infection through uh, whatever, whatever route, that does not make somebody a criminal. But then going and trying to use that as a weapon certainly does make somebody a criminal. Yeah. Right. Good questions, class. Yeah. Yes. And uh, I don't know if you're still listening, but um, we have a few more we'll, we'll catch next time. Uh, let's do how some. Big, how big was the class? Uh, this year I had 65 students. Holy cow. Yeah, it wow. was Good. down at the undergraduate campus. Yeah, they loved it. I had great, uh, great students, and they really enjoyed it, and they said that um, they love virology. Good. All right, let's do some picks of the week. Let's start with Rich. Okay, uh, there's a caution that comes with this. Don't click on this link. There you go. You Oops, did it. Sorry. <laughs> You'll get a whole bunch of rock and roll. Now, you get some other tabs up, and if you click on one, I haven't found a way to silence the music, but if you click on one of the other tabs, you can look through the site. It's only the home page that has the, uh, mm -hmm. the music on it. So um, I found this on a poster in the Atlanta airport. That's where I got the idea for this. We've had conversations before, I think, sort of half tongue in cheek about, you know, why isn't science on the front page the same as Hollywood, right? Right. And where scientists are just right out there and everybody is worshiping them and all of that kind of stuff. Well, in other words, where are our groupies? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Darn well, it. Here's a, somebody has taken that idea seriously. And somebody appears to be a company called Joffrey Bean, which not being a classy dresser, I was unfamiliar with. But apparently this is a um, um, uh, men's, men's uh, designer menswear brand, Joffrey Bean. And they um, give 100% of their net profits for philanthropic causes that count. Right. And so that's their model. And they have this 
That's their business model. <clears throat> they have this program going called Rock Stars of Science, where they pair up in publicity bits uh, scientists with rock and roll stars of one sort or another. And I don't. I don't fully get it. It's uh, it's on their site here. You can listen to some, uh, look at some videos and listen to some stuff, and you can look at all these posters. But I think uh, probably the rock stars themselves are uh, uh, helping to promote the science and this sort of business model in connection with a lot of different scientific uh, organizations is trying to help basically uh, inform or promote the image of science amongst people who, you know, spend most of their time listening to rock and roll. So I poked around here just a little while to see if I could, you know, figure out what was going on. And if you look under the tab called Rock Docs, mm -hmm. okay, just to find out who's there, you will find, there you go, you get, get to another tab, Rock Sorry. Docs. There you go, yeah. Doc Docs, look down on the bottom. Oh, row. it's Rich Condit. Ow! Oh! <laughs> Phil Sharp. Yeah, Phil Sharp is there. He is down there on the left, and up at the top uh, is uh, Liz Blackburn. Yeah. And they got a, a few other familiar faces here. So they've uh, enlisted some uh, people that I uh, certainly respect uh, into this whole thing and are trying to, uh, you know, uh, upgrade the awareness of uh, science. Uh, in the minds of people who might otherwise be mostly interested in rock and roll. Boy, so I thought that was good. That's cool. Phil got old, man. Well, it does happen, you know. <laughs> if we you're lucky, it happens. I don't yeah, know. If you're lucky, it Mick, happens. Mick Jagger isn't so old looking. Um, well, there's yeah, a chemistry yeah. difference there, I think. <laughs> they think they should put the TWIV guys up here. Think so? Well, <laughs> actually, there is a place where you can um, nominate uh, rock docs. Okay. Yeah. So maybe we ought to, and if you, you know, if you do this, Liz Blackburn and, um, uh, and Phil were uh, paired up with, uh, heart, the, <laughs> the musical duo heart. Yeah. Uh -huh. And, uh, they got a bunch of other rock and roll stars. So we could, uh, cool. you know, we could maybe even choose our own rock and roll band. Gee, who, okay. who would the Twiv rock and roll band be? Let's get some good know. questions. Tell us we can what you think. Ask, yeah, ask the listeners. Yeah. Who, who should the Twiv rock and roll band be? Yeah. So there you go. That's cool. I like. I've heard awesome. of this, uh, but I've not seen the website. There you go. That's a good, uh, good, good to hear your thinking of picks while you're traveling, Rich. Well, it was right out there in the Atlanta airport. I thought that was a good sign too. Great. All right, Alan. What do you have? Well, my pick is uh, much sillier than that, uh, it's a, uh, but it's a lot of fun. It's a blog called Inside Insides, um, and this is a, uh, it's maintained by an MRI technician at um, Boston University, and he, he runs, he's in charge of running a three Tesla uh, research MRI. It's, it's used strictly for research projects um, rather than patients. And he periodically runs fruits and vegetables through it. <laughs> and he places a, an animated version of the scans on this blog. So you can go and see, for example, what, uh, what okra looks like on an MRI, um, <laughs> should you be interested. I thought you said Oprah for a moment. No, no, okra. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so that would be a HIPAA violation otherwise. He's got, uh, let's see, ugly fruit. Uh, peach uh, is kind of interesting, um, but just a—I just thought it was a cool little uh, let's mess around with the equipment type of thing. Which, by the way, is where a lot of interesting science has originated. Um, but at this point, he's—he's he's just at the uh, messing around stage, and it, I find the images fascinating. They're That's just cool. fun to watch. Neat, interesting find inside insides. Thank you, Alan. All right, I have two picks because they're both small. Uh, the first one is an announcement by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute that they're starting a new open access journal, top-tier open access journal for biomedical yep. and life sciences. So it's Howard Hughes, Max Planck, and the Wellcome Trust. It's going to be open access. Everyone can read it, rapid publication, and only the best science, they say. 
I don't know who's going to determine that. Oh, they're going to have an editorial board composed only of scientists. So they'll be making all the decisions. Right. My suggest they haven't come up with a title for the journal yet. Um, my suggestion was they should call it PLOS2, T-O-O. <laughs> right. I somehow doubt that. They have a couple of innovations here that are sort of interesting. Uh, they're going to publish the reviews. Right. As right. well as the papers. I thought that was interesting. I like that. That'll that'll keep the that'll keep the reviewers uh, cool, though they're anonymous. Still, uh, knowing that your review is going to be published, it's like the difference between a a write-in or a phone-in grant review uh, and one where you got to be face to face at a panel. There's a difference. Um, there was another thing. They're going to try and yeah. fast track everything, essentially. Right. Um, and they're hoping to do this without the usual infrastructure that comes with most journals where there's a research editor who triages the papers. Mm -hmm. um, so I think part of it is they're considering paying their reviewers. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Whereas yeah. peer reviewers obviously normally work for free. Um, so instead of, instead of having a staff that would handle a lot of this, they would pay the peer reviewers, yeah. which is just kind of a different model i don't know how well that'll work or if it'll work or if they'll stick to it so our my pick of the week last week was the tree of life and that's by jonathan eisen who is a big mm -hmm. advocate of open access so he has a comment on this as well he said this is great news and uh, he thinks that it would be better if plus biology was run by active scientists which is what this new journal is going to be done so he likes it all right, so that's cool. We'll see how that sorts out. And then my other pick is a video of uh, Fran an interview with Francis Collins on Bloomberg, uh, which was sent along to me by Steve Goff the other day, and he is discussing the sad state of the NIH budget. Talks about mm. the impact of the federal deficit on funding for the agency and how to expedite medical research breakthroughs into treatments for patients, which we talked a little bit about today. Mm -hmm. So it's getting grim. The funding is getting lower and lower, and labs are closing down, and it's really sad. I know that all of us uh, in the country are suffering the, from the bad economy, but this is a, a short-sighted solution to break up your scientific establishment bit by yeah, bit. Yeah, because you can't just turn that back on again. Yeah. Right. So you should have a look and see just what uh, he thinks about it. Pretty sobering. I'm, I'm reminded, I don't know if we've ever done this on Twitter. I'm reminded of a, this is peripherally relevant, a Winston Churchill cl uh, quote where uh, somebody suggested to him during the Second World War that they uh, cut the budgets for um, the arts to help fund the war effort. Yeah. And Churchill's comment was, well, then what are we fighting for? Nice. <laughs> Good one. He's a smart guy. Yeah. I don't think they make them like him anymore. Well, or if they, they, do, aren't, a, they aren't abundant. If they nah. do, they go into banking or law. Maybe or rehab. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We have a listener pick of the week from Kathy Spindler, our friend out at the University of Michigan. Hey, guys, this is a link to an NPR story about a songwriter in residence program at the National Institute for Mathematical and Biological Sciences at the University of Tennessee. The gist of it is that it's another way to try to improve communication between scientists and everyone else. Scientists and mu musicians compare notes. So they got a bunch of musicians here to try and write songs that uh, would help communicate science to people so you can check that out she and says, they got a they got a song by jake clark titled sexual selection all right okay so and it's okay so it's worth listening to all right cool. thanks for that kathy and that will do it if you like twiv maybe you'd like twip and twim we have two other podcasts someone on facebook page i think said hey you should talk about twim and twip more so you can find those uh, on the same places that you can find TWIV, which is at iTunes, the Zoom Marketplace, TWIV.tv, or microworld.org. There is an app that you can use to stream these 
uh, podcast to your smartphone or Android device. That's at microbeworld.org slash app. Always, we love to get your questions and comments. Keep sending them to twiv at twiv.tv. I just noticed our little fan page over on Facebook just passed 900 members or likers or whatever it is that you call. So that's cool. And I noticed people are posting virus-related stuff there. That's great. Mm-hmm. Everyone can post, so feel free to post stuff. Someone just posted a, the announcement that Rinderpest has been officially declared eradicated. We talked about that not too long ago here on TWIV. So yeah. that's cool. Thanks, everyone. Alan Dove can be found at... Well, he's behind this brand new door that he built. Yes, yes. <laughs> Just in installed office. a door on my office. And you can find him behind that door or at alandove.com. Thanks a lot, Alan. Thank you. Always a pleasure. And Rich Condit is back in Florida at Gainesville. Thanks, Rich. You're quite welcome. It's good, good to time. have you back. Good to be here. We like it very much. Dixon is uh, AWOL today. He's fishing over in Pennsylvania. Ah, okay. Can't blame him. He loves to do it. Yeah. Yep. And I am Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us, everyone. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Uh, you know, maybe the. Um the graphic for this ought to be the abdomen, being able to actually see that thing. It's in figure one, one A. Um, oh, that uh, CD4 abdomen, yes. right? Yes. Yeah, that's good. That thing just fits into some wrinkle on the protein. Isn't that it's amazing? It's incredible. The whole yeah. thing is incredible. I don't know who would have thunk that. I mean, if anybody had come to me for, with any of these ideas, I would have just laughed them right out of my office. You yeah. know. You know, go do your work, okay? Quit bothering me with these silly ideas. Right. That's why people can't listen to their PIs all the time. Right? That's right. Some, I think it was uh, somebody in Phil's lab told me that um, uh, when Arnie Burke came, uh, came to Phil with the idea of doing uh, S1s to map introns, Phil told him to go fly a kite, and Arnie went and did the experiments anyway.